speaker is uh, Alex, who's going to tell us about uh, the PHM Empire. Hey, everyone. Congratulations on waking up in time for my talk. You should all congratulate me for waking up on time for my talk. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Fiat Shamir and the standard model, or if you want the flashier title, Fiat Shamir from pra practice to theory. Credit must go to Ron for this wonderful phrasing. It is like ingenious. Uh, so this is based on mostly on two joint works, one with Ran, Yile, Justin, Guy, and Ron, the other with Ran and Daniel. Uh, but more generally, this has been a super exciting research area over the last couple of years. There have been all these works. Uh, and in particular, I think there are a lot of exciting open questions left to be tackled. So hopefully, like borrowing from Elon's terminology from yesterday, hopefully uh, there is a, like many of you 20 papers on, on uh, stuff related to this. That would be, that would be super nice. OK, so uh, I'll bore you for a couple of slides with stuff you already know. But so we're talking about public coin interactive protocols, which means that we have an interactive protocol where every verifier message is uniformly random. Uh, and satisfying the standard completeness and soundness conditions. Uh, so this is a model of computation. And we've known for a long time that it's a super powerful model of computation. So this is just like one phrasing of, this, of, like, of the like, meta statements that interactive uh, protocols are very powerful. Uh, and Fiat Shamir heuristic sort of turns this on, it, on its head and asks, do you actually need to interact to do any of this stuff? And uh, so we know in some settings that you absolutely do need interaction in order to uh, like achieve certain properties. But somewhat counterintuitively, uh, Fiat Shamir say that at least heuristically, uh, it turns out you don't need interaction in a lot of those cases. So it's uh, some sort of black magic that allows you to convert in public coin interactive protocols into non-interactive ones. So, uh, so here's how it works. Start with an interactive uh, protocol on the left. Fiat Shamir turns it into a non-interactive protocol in the following way. Uh, we have some hash function that is publicly known and agreed upon between the prover and the verifier. And now the prover is going to send an entire transcript of the left-hand side protocol in one shot. And the way you, the one way you can do this is by computing a first message. And instead of waiting for the verifier to say anything back, just compute hash of your first message and maybe the instance and uh, pretend that's what the verifier sent to you then uh, that allows you to send your second prover message like based on that, uh, that verifier message. And then repeatedly just keep hashing the transcript so far, treat that as the next verifier message, and use this to compute your next prover message. So this is one way for the prover to produce an entire transcript of a protocol in one shot. And so then the verifier can just, uh, can just check that all of the hashes are computed correctly and check that the public coin transcript is accepting uh, and uh, accept if this holds. So, yeah, so, so, so what, I, what I mean is that we don't have a proof. right? Like one can conjecture that if you start with a sound protocol on the left, uh, that you get a sound protocol on the right. But it should be a priori completely unclear whether or not that's actually true. So it's not a compilation is saying that this is something that people use and no one has broken. Yes, which we'll, which we'll, we'll get to it. Yes. Can you just a bit from the uninitiated? What's a public coin? Oh, so I mean, so interactive protocol, is interactive protocol OK? Public coin means that all of the verifier messages are random strings. There's no private verifier randomness. And so you need this here in order for this compiler to make any sense. Because the like, when you compute the verifier messages to be hash of the transcripts, there's no secret randomness that you've generated. So in order for this to, like, in order for this to make sense, the verifier needs to be able to know whether or not to accept the transcript without having any secret state. Did you dialogue to the set? To the setup, like you have some, some, some coin in the sky, is it both? I mean, that, well, that, that, the, how do you model the hash function? And we'll, we'll, we, will, we will get to it. So, uh, but for now, let's not, let's not worry too much about the model. Uh, just imagine that somebody has handed you a hash function. Like, we're using SHA-2 and we're happy. OK, so it is very hard to overstate how influential this methodology has been especially in practical crypto. And of course, to the practitioners here, I don't actually have to explain that to you. Presumably, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, so, so why, why is it so nice? 
So it's very powerful in the sense that, as I, as I was explaining earlier, interactive protocols allow you to do a lot of things that a priori non like that, that, that you couldn't do on your own. But now uh, Fiat Jamir is saying, actually, you could have done these in one shot non-interactive protocols. And, uh, and this is very useful. So uh, there's very low overhead in the sense that if you have a hash function, which is very efficient, then the overhead over doing the interactive protocol is very low. Um, and it allows you to do a wide variety of different things. So three specific things that I want to highlight is that this gives you very efficient signature schemes. It gives you very efficient non-interactive zero-knowledge arguments. And it gives you uh, what previously called computationally sound proofs or, or SNARGs or you know, any, any word describing these. Uh, uh, so these are three very different things that Fiat Shamir, all, uh, Fiat Shamir al allows you to do. And uh, our goal in this work and in that long sequence of works that you saw earlier was to try to establish a stronger theoretical basis for this transformation. So, so far, only, I've, I've only said that soundness is heuristically preserved. So, so, so the question is, what, what can we prove about it? So uh, just uh, before getting to that, let me just, in slightly more detail, highlight one of the three applications that I just said. So let's talk about delegation. So uh, again, apologies for if all of you know this already. But, uh, but so a, a publicly verifiable non-interactive delegation scheme, or depending on your like, mood of the day, you might, or might not want to call this a snarg, uh, uh, is, is something in the following setting. Uh, you have, you have a, a weak verifier that wants to be convinced that some instance x is in a language. And, uh, and you have now some sort of setup giving you a common reference string. And then a one message argument system from prover to verifier that is very short. And again, publicly verifiable. We don't want any, uh, any secret state. So, uh, so one way that you can get such a scheme is by applying Fiat Shamir to the analogous object except with interaction. So an interactive uh, pub, uh, yeah, public coin interactive arguments with very low communication. Uh, and we have these things either in the computational setting, uh, the Killian protocol and its derivatives, or, uh, or in, the, in the proof setting as well, either the, the uh, GKR protocol or the RR protocol uh, for bounded depth and bounded space, respectively. And so you can apply Fiat Shamir to uh, any of these things. Uh, and get a candidate, non uh, candidate snark for some complexity class. Um, and there aren't very many ways we know how to do this. So one is the Fiat Nier approach. The other is by taking uh, you know, linear PCPs, et cetera, and, and using some uh, extractability or knowledge assumption. And, uh, and this is basically it, as far as I know. Uh, we have approaches in these two families, and that's the only way we know how to get snarks. So, so Fiat Shamir is not only, not only does Fiat Shamir like allow you to do many different things, like some of the things that it allows you to do cannot be done by other means, as far as we can tell, or at least are very difficult to do. So that's, uh, that's my pitch for the applicability, and the practitioners could all argue that way better than me. Uh, but now I want to go back to the question of, is the Fiat Shamir transform actually secure? So all I've said so far is that soundness is heuristically preserved. So, so as, as was coming up in discussion before, like the key question to argue security is how we're modeling this hash function that I said is up in the sky that the prover and verifier have access to. So one can show that in the random oracle model, uh, you get security. So, so, so what is the random oracle model? V very briefly, you model the hash function as a uniformly random function, and you have a security model where the, uh, where the adversarial prover only has query access to this function, so possibly a, a, a strong modeling yeah. assumption. But if you make it, then you can show that the Fiat Shamir uh, heuristic is provably secure in this model for like basically any, any application that you care about. Um, not quite true, but almost true. So, so that's nice. So you could ask if we're done. Uh, but you know, we're making a strong modeling assumption here. And, uh, and you can ask, well, fine, but what if you use a concrete hash function? You know, either a single hash function or maybe sample, you can have a model where you sample the hash function from some family, and then you can ask if you can prove security in the, in the, in the standard sense. And this turns out to be a, a, a difficult question, a deep question, and, uh, and the very first answer is definitely no, this is 
uh, what do you call it, uh, impossible uh, unconditionally, unconditionally impossible. Uh, so, so what do we know? We know, okay, so, j so just for terminology, let's say a hash function is Fiat Shamir compatible if you can use it, uh, sorry, for, for a protocol pi, if you can do Fiat Shamir using H and pi, then we know that by now that there are specific public coin interactive protocols, uh, constant round, uh, so, in, so you can do Fiat Shamir using a random oracle for them, uh, but there are such protocols such that for any hash function, H, or any family of hash functions that you want to sample H from, uh, the Fiat Shamir protocol is provably insecure, unsound. So that's uh, super unfortunate. Uh, on the other hand, the, the only protocols for which we have uh, unconditional counterexamples, or uh, demonstrates uh, counterexamples to Fiat Shamir are quite contrived, not something that you would actually use. So the, the question of, you know, is Fiat Shamir, uh, does Fiat Shamir work for any pr uh, protocol that you care about personally is still a, a valid question. Although, uh, although there's this uh, TCC work this year on uh, Fiat Shamir for Killian that starts to say even then maybe not. Uh, but uh, but that's, uh, I'll leave that for, for other people to discuss. Uh, but at least the, the old counterexamples are very contrived. So, okay, so what's up? Sentence about the Killian result? What? I mean, this is not my result. Uh, you can wait. Are any of the authors here? James is here, right? I mean, but the, but the, their result is that is that if you, like, there are uh, there is like for example, there's a, a bad uh, Killian hash function, like hash function for the four message Killian protocol, such that no matter how you instantiate the PCP, and no matter how you instantiate the Fiat Shamir hash function, you uh, you don't get soundness. I think that's what it is, right? So still somewhat contrived, but less contrived. <laughs> okay, so so one option after seeing the Barak and uh, Shafiael uh, theorems are just to give up and go home. Uh, we could do that, uh, but another thing we can do is try to identify what the problem is, and uh, and try to prove that Fiat Shamir works in certain cases. In particular, we want to prove that it works for protocols that we care about. Uh, so here's one property that, uh, that we can uh, focus on. So the counterexamples are uh, for interactive arguments. That is, the interactive protocol that we're trying to compile only satisfies computational soundness. So one could conjecture that, I mean, you could all, I mean, Fiat Shamir was also just a conjecture before, but you could just boldly conjecture that if you assume that the interactive protocol satisfies statistical soundness rather than computational soundness, that, uh, that then it's possible to instantiate Fiat Shamir. Uh, a priori, it might be sort of unclear why this is the right property to isolate. Like, why, why, you know, why do you want to conjecture soundness when you just wrote down a counterexample? But uh, it's, a, it's a conjecture you could make. Um, and for, the talk, we're going, for this talk, we're going to focus on trying to get Fiat Shamir when we start with an interactive proof. So this is not the end of the story. Even if this question were completely answered, like, the real question, or I don't know about the real question, but one really important question is, can we do Fiat Shamir for Killian? Because we want snargs in the standard model. Uh, and the rest of the talk is not going to get at least snargs for all of NP in the standard model. That, that can't happen if we're compressing a proof instead of an argument. But this is at least a starting point where we can see, see if we can prove anything in this, in this case. OK, so an advantage of focusing on the case of interactive proofs instead of interactive arguments is that there's actually a concrete property of the Fiat Shamir hash function that we can isolate such that, like a, a typical security property, like in the like a game-based security property, such that if the hash function satisfies the security property, then it provably instantiates Fiat Shamir. So that's super nice. It's called correlation intractability. Ryan is here, so I'm sort of morally obligated to indoctrinate you into the cult of correlation intractability. Uh, sorry? Release. What do you mean release? Oh, I see. Okay. But in, <laughs> so in any case, I will voluntarily indoctrinate you all into the church of correlation and tractability. So, uh, so here's the security property. Uh, so a hash family H is correlation and tractable for some sparse relation R. So that the relation has an input X and an output Y. If the following holds, uh, 
given a randomly sampled hash function from the family, it should be hard to find an input x such that x and the hash of x, if you set that to y, satisfies the relation r. So, so just in more, in more symbols, uh, the adversary should be able to output such an input x with negligible, only negligible probability. And, uh, and note that I said that we have a sparse relation. So by sparse, I mean that for every x, there are very few y, which satisfy the relation along with x, which translates to saying that random oracles are correlation intractable. That's, uh, that's what sparsity guarantees you. So, uh, so an example, uh, a specific example that's going to matter in this talk is forgetting about relations, just thinking about functions. So by that I mean just if you have a function from inputs to outputs, you can consider the relation of all pairs x comma f of x. So this is a very sparse relation. There's only one y for every x. So the first thing that I want to show you is that if a hash family is correlation intractable for all sparse relations, so the, the previous statement holds for every sparse R, then we provably can compile inter public coin interactive proofs, constant round public coin interactive proofs, into non-interactive arguments via fiat -Shamir that we can and then we can prove security based on the correlation intractability of the hash family. So I'm just going to show you the three message case. It generalizes quite reasonably, but the proof is super simple in the three message case. So let's take a three. Uh, what about the sparse relation x h of x? So how can h be? H is no, 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 no. So, so the, yeah, the security property is you tell me the relation, then I sample the hash function. Oh, so you sample it from a random. Yes, line. yes. This is a distribution on hash functions. So you first sample a relation with high probability of the function sampled from the family. It's for every it's for relation. You it's a relation? Relation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ad relation is adversarial. Hash family, the one you sample is, is good. Yes. And you have, you have examples that uh, uh, you can do things with the random oracle, which you cannot, which you cannot do with the correlation intractability. Ah, good. So I mean, well, the random oracle definitely can't do Fiat-Shamir for Killian. Sorry, the, sorry. The correlation intractability doesn't seem to be sufficient to do Fiat-Shamir for Killian. It also isn't sufficient to do Fiat-Shamir for the counterexample protocols, which random oracles are. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. But in any case, let me show you this proof. It's super simple. So take a three-message protocol, alpha, beta, gamma, where beta is a random string. Uh, and we uh, suppose it's sound. We want to show that the fiat Shamir protocol on the right, sorry, oh shoot, yes, on your right, is sound. Uh, so, so what do we want to say? Like, what does soundness mean? It means the prover can't produce this alpha and gamma, so that alpha, beta, gamma is a good, is a good transcript. Uh, so here's how we can argue this. Just consider a relation where the inputs are alphas and the outputs are betas. And the relation is satisfied if there exists any gamma at all, making the transcript alpha, beta, gamma, excepting for x. So in order to be done, uh, we need to argue that the relation is sparse. If this relation is sparse, then the correlation and tractability of h with respect to r will guarantee the soundness of the right-hand side protocol. And this is because like, the correlation and tractability will say it's hard to find an, a, a first message alpha such that there even exists a gamma like in the world that you could write down, making the uh, transcript accepting. So correlation intractability suffices as long as this relation is sparse. But the sparsity of the relation follows directly from the soundness of the three message protocol. Because that exactly says that, no like soundness says that no matter what alpha you pick, and this is statistical soundness, that's important. So no matter what alpha you pick, for a random beta, there will not exist a gamma. That's what the left-hand side soundness says, because it's soundness against unbounded provers. So that exactly translates to this relation being sparse. And so correlation and tractability will get a soundness of the fiat protocol. Anything when trying to apply it to arguments? Uh, that doesn't go through, or heuristically, does go through? Wait, sorry, you mean this argument? This approach, yes. So I mean, th I, mean, I mean, this approach, like, the proof definitely fails because we can't argue the relation is sparse. Example. Yeah, so, so, so here's something you can do. It's maybe not, maybe not so nice, but what you can do is have a computational analog of correlation and tractability where 
you, you know, have, have some notion of a relation being computationally sparse. It's got to be you know, a random relation now. But a random relation can be computationally sparse if it's hard to find things in the relation. Uh, and, uh, and then you could hypothesize correlation tractability for computationally sparse relations, but it doesn't hold. <coughs> Sorry, I, what is the non-interactive argument? So who's choosing this H from the family? So yeah, so th th there are two options. Either you imagine you have set up choosing the H. I mean, it doesn't depend on the, like it, it's, it's sampled independently of the language and everything. So you could have set up, or you can have the verifier uh, pick H, because we're only talking about soundness right now. Uh, now, if you additionally care about things like zero knowledge, then you have to worry about the verifier picking H. But, uh, but for now, by non-interactive, I just mean one of those two things. I let the verifier have, like, so you, you could have the verifier, like, this hash function can be picked once and for all, for example, if you want to do many things. So there's, like, somebody has to pick a hash function once, and then you can uh, have protocols, you know, you can compile any protocol however many times you want in one message. Well, inside, you, you first need to fix the relation before you randomly choose the H. Yes. So you'll run into trouble if uh, if you want to prove things about the hash function, right? So that, that that that's that's what your thing amounts to saying, right? So that the standard soundness won't apply if you want to prove things about the about the hash function. Uh, although uh, sometimes we can even argue adaptive soundness, which would be worrying about the things that you're talking about. Basically, it's in the uniform random string model, right, to pick this H, like the argument. That depends on your hash function. If it's a public coin hash function, then yes. So in the examples that, like, in the examples of hash functions that we, have, that we write down later, all of them turn out to be public coin. So we will get things in the uniform random string model. More questions? I'm doing that time. Okay. All right, so this shows that correlation and tractability suffices for fiat Shamir, at least for three message protocols. You can extend it to constant rounds public coin protocols, uh, interactive proofs. Uh, so this should hopefully convince you of the utility of the security notion. So this is quite different from the arguments case because there is a security property we can phrase that suffices and that also isn't just like unconditionally unsatisfiable. That, uh, that would be bad too. Okay, so let's, let's go back to the question. So we wanted to know if we could instantiate fiat Shamir for interactive proofs in the standard model. And what the previous couple of slides tell you is that if we have a correlation intractable hash family, then the answer is yes. So maybe, maybe that gives us some hope. Unfortunately, the answer is still like, for, so the question as stated was open for quite some time, I think. There were, I'm trying to think, of, so probably the magic functions paper, so that's back in 99, was already asking you know, if you could do Fiat Shamir for very specific protocols. So this is post-correlation intractability. I think it was clear at the time. Well, somebody older than me would understand better than me. But I think probably since the late 90s is a question that people were thinking about. Uh, there was no progress for quite a while until about 2016, I would say. Uh, there were some negative results. I don't want to exactly get into the details, but there are some kinds of black box impossibility results for instantiating Fiat Shamir even, this, even in this restricted setting. So that might scare you. I think the scarier thing is that take any protocol you want. Like take, uh, for example, I mean, you could talk about Killian, that seems hard, but you could also talk about just like classical zero knowledge protocols from the 80s. Take any specific one of them that you want, ask, can we do Fiat Shamir for it? Any specific one of them. And there was no answer for, you know, until quite recently, which I think is pretty bizarre. Uh, but, but there was basically nothing known. When you, when you, I mean, these protocols usually have a uh, commitment scheme. So you mean, when you say instantiating them, you mean for some commitment scheme or for all? Well, so, if, so if, you, if it's the NP protocols, yes. But you could also talk about the protocol for QR or discrete log or LWE or something like that. Yeah, then there's no commitment. Well, the, the commitment scheme is implicit. OK. So, but yes, you could also ask for like the three coloring or Hamiltonicity protocol, you know, use now our commitment or use the discrete log one message commitment, anything like this. And then, then you could ask. OK. So, so, but we had nothing. We had basically nothing. Uh, 
This is what I was just saying. And, uh, oh, and, so, and this is related to the question of whether zero knowledge composes in parallel, because you know, this uh, magic functions paper uh, showed that if you can do fiat Shamir for any of these protocols, so think of parallel repetition of a classical three message zero knowledge protocol, uh, it's provably not zero knowledge if you can do fiat Shamir for it. And so this would resolve questions about composition of, uh, of zero knowledge for natural protocols. There were, there were unnatural counterexamples already, but it was open for these natural protocols. So what's going on? Very, very strange. Very str I, I would call it a very strange state of affairs. Um, but what I want to talk to you about for the, rest of the, for the rest of today is that in the last few years, we've actually come up with positive results. And it's super exciting. Uh, so, so first, uh, we had positive results under what I'll call strong assumptions. And I'll explain much more about what that means. Uh, so just to take a couple of theorem statements from one of the, from one, uh, one of the papers. So we can instantiate correlation intractable hash functions and therefore do fiat Shamir by either making very strong but still simple and meaningful assumptions or by focusing on specific protocols of interest. Or, and by or, I, I sort of mean and slash or. You can do either of these things or both of these things. Uh, and I really want to highlight the second of these. Uh, it really matters what protocol you're trying to compile. Like, it turn, like, and may, maybe, maybe this is obvious in retrospect, but doing fiat Shamir for some, like even when you focus already on interactive proofs, it turns out, at least as far as I can tell, that doing fiat Shamir for some interactive proofs is way easier, at least proving security, is way easier than doing fiat Shamir for other interactive proofs. And like, one of the very key ideas in these works has been trying to isolate some nice properties of interactive proofs that we, like, such that there are interactive proofs that we care about satisfying the properties, and we can instantiate fiat Shamir for protocol satisfying these properties. So let me talk about this. Sorry. Are there easy concrete examples? Like, uh, yes, and we'll, get, and we'll get to it. But for example, the, the, the uh, GMR, uh, like the quadratic residuosity protocol, for example, like, some classical zero knowledge protocols fall into this. Also, as it turns out, the GKR uh, delegation protocol, we can do fiat Shamir for that as well. OK, so let me talk about the assumptions. Uh, so this is, again, this is the strong assumption section. There will be a standard assumption section later. Um, but for now, uh, like this, this first work is making, and this first work and many of the preceding works, sorry for being somewhat anachronistic, but uh, many works were making hardness assumptions of the following form, which I call optimal hardness. So like optimal hardness of some problem intuitively means that a uh, polynomial time adversary can't break the assumption with better than some kind of trivial probability. So trivial probability essentially means guessing some secret. And the assumption will be that you can't do any better than guessing the secret uniformly at random, possibly with some polynomial in your description length overhead. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a strong assumption, definitely not a standard assumption. Um, but so the example you should think of is if you have some one-way function f, like the optimal hardness of f means that you can't invert f with better than poly and security parameter over 2 to the security parameter probability, um, where the input length to this function is lambda. So uh, so it's a strong assumption, but on the other hand, uh, okay, so a couple of things. I am talking about polynomial time algorithms here. So for a lot of, for a lot of problems like discrete log or uh, LWE, if you run in some exponential time, but not fully exponential time, like basically there's something better than a two to the lambda algorithm for most of the problems that we care about. It's not exactly two to the lambda. It's like maybe two to the lambda over two, sometimes worse things. Uh, but here, this assumption is about polynomial time algorithms. And these exponential time algorithms don't seem to translate to polynomial time algorithms that work with non-trivial success probability. So the assumptions are not like broken right off the bat. Uh, so in, in particular, both like search LWE for certain parameter settings and discrete log over elliptic curves, like in the state of the art, Set, like in the state of the art, as far as attacks go, don't like the assumptions are not violated. They are true as far as we know. 
It's not, it's not obvious, but uh, in this, so in one of the earlier papers, uh, Ran, Gile, uh, Leo, and Ron, they analyzed it for standard discrete log, and they at least said that it's almost broken. I forget if they said it was exactly broken, but it's almost broken. The electric curve groups. The yeah, he said standard discrete log. I assume that to mean like ZP star. I think it's not obvious, but it's it, but I think it has been analyzed and it looks at least almost broken. Over like over ZP star. D discrete log over ZP star, you can get something non-trivial. As opposed to like discrete log over elliptic curves or search LWE, like there is like absolutely like I don't know of any attacks that are better than literally guessing over and over again. Okay. So that's the assumption that we make in this first work. So here are here are two results now. So we can get a publicly verifiable non-interactive delegation for uh, bounded depth computation. Uh, assuming the optimal hardness of some fully homomorphic encryption scheme. And so by optimal hardness of this, I mean that given a public key and a ciphertext, it should be very hard to find the secret key. This essentially corresponds to an, a search LWE assumption where you're also given out some sort of circular secure encryptions in, in a regev encryption scheme. So it's search LWE hardness with a bit of circular security thrown in. Uh, so, and the way we do it, is by showing that under this assumption, we can write down a hash function that instantiates Fiat Shamir for the GKR interactive delegation scheme for bounded depth computation. Uh, and again, you know, if, if you care about these things, we can get nice things like adaptive soundness and rely on a uniform CRS for the delegation. But, uh, but in any case, I think we should, if you, if you care about these things, you should probably use SHA-2 instead of this hash function, right? But, uh, but I, it, I think it's a nice... You may need to find it inside a more elaborate protocol and still be in the theory, man. Ah, sure. Okay, that's, that's fair. So, so, uh, so we get nice properties uh, in theory land. Uh, I would not recommend using this in practice. But like I said, the, the goal from the beginning is to establish a theoretical basis for Fiat Shamir. So I'm, I'm certainly not focusing on practical efficiency in this talk. Okay, so that's a delegation result. Uh, we also show you can get uh, NISIX for all NP languages, assuming now the, uh, roughly the same thing, but forget the circular security. So it's just you know, that search LWE is super, super hard. So, uh, and, and we do it by uh, instantiating a Fiat Shamir for a particular instantiation of the classical three coloring protocol. And by a particular instantiation, I mean that I pick the commitment scheme to be something specific. And again, nice properties can get either statistical zero knowledge or adaptive soundness and have a uniform CRS again. So, this is not succinct NISIC. It's NISIC. Yes, the second thing is NISIC. The first thing is succinctness. Under a better assumption? Yes, this is, so I'm just going through, like, these, were, th these are results based on optimal hardness, and then later we'll get results. Oh, you can show how this is result can be improved in this Yes. Okay. No worries. <laughs> okay. But, uh, like, yeah, so we have two, like, there were two sets of results from this line of work. One, were, one set of results was based on optimal hardness assumptions, and then later, punchline, we were able to get some results based on standard assumptions. But for now, I'm talking about optimal hardness and what you can get from it. Uh, yeah. In particular, again, like, spoilers, we still don't know how to do Fiat Shamir for this three coloring protocol based on standard assumptions. Still open. But, but the main takeaway point I want you to get from this slide is that we wrote down delegation schemes and, and NISICs uh, that are secure unless there are better LWE algorithms than the state of the art. So it's a nice win-win. Uh, so, so I want to give you a bit, uh, a bit about how we, how we prove this. Uh, apologies for skipping over like many things, but I, I want to show you a little bit about how we prove these kinds of results, how we're actually showing Fiat Shamir can, can be instantiated. So, so here's, here's a hash function that you could think about, a hash function you could think about. Key to the hash function is going to be some ciphertext for some encryption scheme. So C is the key to the hash function. An input to the hash function 
is going to be uh, an encryption key, or let's say we have symmetric encryption, so a, so a key for the encryption scheme. So I've just swapped, so I've swapped some things around. Uh, and so, so what's the hash function? It's the only thing it could be. So if you, if you have a key as input and a ciphertext as your hash key, the hash output is the decryption of the ciphertext under the key. So uh, hash functions like of this flavor are already proposed by Fiat and Shamir back in the 80s, uh, of course without proofs, but, uh, but the idea has been around. Um, and, the yes, the original Fiat Shamir paper. Uh, so, so what we're able to show uh, is that if the encryption scheme in question is super strong, namely it's satisfying some sort of optimal security condition, then this hash function is correlation intractable. And depending on how strong of an assumption you make, it can actually be correlation intractable for all relations. Give you Fiat Shamir for all proofs. But then the, the assumption is going to be correspondingly very strong. Uh, so, so let me show you how the proof works very briefly. So again, I haven't defined anything. But I think somehow showing the proof is better than showing the definitions. Uh, so, so one argue that if this hash function is not correlation intractable, then there's something wrong with the encryption scheme, meaning that it's, it's not a perfect encryption scheme. So, so how is it going to work? Here, here's, the, here's the reduction. It's sort of the only thing, sort of yeah, one of the only things you could think of. Oh, I should say, um, this so this proof first appeared in the CCRR paper. The proof technique. I would say belongs with uh, Yael, Guy, and Ron from the previous paper. They're they're doing they're they're not arguing about this hash function, but they're making a, they're using a very similar proof idea. And in some sense, it sort of got all of this uh, Fiat Shamir uh, instantiation started. So I think a lot of credit should go to these works. Um, but uh, but here's the, here's the proof. Suppose the hash function is broken, meaning that you get a random ciphertext, and the adversary is able to produce a key such that some relation is satisfied by the key and the decryption of the ciphertext along with the key. So that's breaking correlation and tractability. Now let's, let's, let's break the encryption. Let's say the encryption scheme is broken. What is going to be broken? I'm going to show you that if you're given an encryption of some key dependent message in the encryption scheme, so the, um, there's going to be some function f, I'm going to hand you an encryption of f of the secret key under the secret key. And I'm going to show you how to recover the secret key with better than guessing probability. So, so, that's, like, so, so that's what we want to do. And the reduction is sort of the, the, first, like the, the only thing you could do. If you're given a random ciphertext, you know, you're trying to break the encryption scheme, just feed it to this adversary, get out some, some key, and hope that this key is actually the secret key that was hidden, you know, the, the, the secret key that you're supposed to be looking for. So like this hash function adversary hands out some key. It's, got, it's guaranteed to satisfy some property. And you can just hope that it's the, secret, the randomly sampled secret key from before. And uh, so you'll output this key and hope that you win. That's the reduction. Sounds, maybe, maybe sounds too good to be true. Uh, but, but it turns out that you can show that this breaks the encryption scheme at least a little bit. And the, and the OK, so I haven't ent entirely specified what's going on. I said there's some function. I haven't told you what the function is. Here's the function. It's, it's a randomized function. Uh, given an x, it samples a random y satisfying the relation with x. Uh, and this should make sense because of what the adversary is looking for. The adversary is looking for, for a key such that key and decryption of the ciphertext satisfies the relation. So the function at least is compatible with this. So it's an inefficient function? Yes. Absolutely, yes. And I, I will. Absolutely. I, will, uh, this, I agree that you should be unhappy, uh, and I will discuss. <laughs> you should be unhappy. You shouldn't. You should always be unhappy in research so you can do more, right? But, uh, <laughs> OK. So this is the function. As pointed out, it is inefficient. Uh, but so let me, let me say a little bit about the proof. Uh, so what's, like, what is this C star? This, this, this ciphertext handed to you? Like, or or what, is the, what is the hash function defined by the C star? What does it look like? It's not a random ciphertext, right? It's an encryption of a function of the secret key under the secret key, not totally random. But intuitively, you can think of this, this hash function, as a random hash function from the family, sort of conditioned on there being some planted bad points satisfying the relation in it. 
Like this encryption of f of k under k is one of these bad points. So intuitively, you might think of this ciphertext defining a hash function, which is random, subject to having this planted bad point in it. So now, intuitively, the argument will be that since the, the, the inner adversary is guaranteed to find a bad point, if your planted bad point looks like a random one, then the probability that he outputs the secret key you were looking for should be roughly his probability divided by the number of bad points in the world. The number of bad points in the world is much less than the number of keys in the world. So intuitively, you're going to be guessing the key with non-trivial probability. And uh, so this is informal, but you can basically argue this. And, you, and, and this is how the proof works. So uh, we need some additional hypotheses about the encryption scheme for this to work, but it's not too bad. Like, you can write down encryption schemes. Like, they're, they're, they're not, the additional properties are fairly mild. Uh, so this is how. Some of, the, some of the works proceed. But I do want to highlight exactly this issue that was pointed out. So like, in general, this f is an inefficient function. I'm saying, sample a, like, given x sample a uniformly random bad point for x. This is quite inefficient. Like, in general, you're going to have to enumerate and, and then sample. Which means that if your eventual goal is to prove this based on a standard assumption, you're going to be in trouble. At least intuitively, you're going to be in trouble. Because arguing about security with a universal quantifier over inefficient functions in the setup is sometimes quite difficult. So I don't mean to say that it is impossible to, to, to make this go through. So like if your goal is still to do Fiat-Shamir for all proofs, get correlation tractability for all relations, you're going to have to deal with this problem. But this already suggests that it might be easier to identify situations where f can be an efficient function that might make it easier to prove security. And so this is exactly uh, what we do. Um, in, so in, this, in order to get the uh, delegation and the NISIC results that I've already showed you, we, we exactly do that. So, so take a relation R. We say it's efficiently sampleable if the function f that I just told you is efficient. Uh, and immediately, that already, like, that already tells you the security proof from the previous slide is already relying on a slightly weaker, or not, or not just like a noticeably weaker assumption actually than before. Now, in order to get Fiat Shamir, right off the bat, you only have to assume that encryption scheme satisfies this strong KDM security with respect to efficient KDM functions. So that's a starting point. And basically, in this work, we push, we, we do some heavy lifting on top of that to weaken the assumption as much as possible. For example, all the way down to search LWE, search LWE hardness. Um, so, so. So we, we, so we first do this. We show that under these nice assumptions, we can get hash functions that are correlation intractable for all efficiently sampleable relations. And, uh, so, but that's not the end of the story, because a priori, it's totally unclear if these are useful for anything. Uh, but we also show that this weaker form of correlation intractability still suffices to do fiat Shamir for interactive proofs that we care about. Sorry, but when you say simple assumptions, but what do you mean by simple? Is are you? I mean, I mean. The, uh, no, no. I mean, I, so far, I mean the ones that I've only that I've referenced before. So, LWE is super hard. Okay. Super hard. okay. Yes. Uh, so, so very quickly, I want to say a little bit about the delegation result before moving on, um, because uh, I said we do Fiat Shamir for the GKR protocol, which is this nice. Uh, think of it as some check based protocol to do delegation for bounded depth, com bounded depth computation. Uh, but there are already like some worries. Namely, this is not a constant round protocol. It's a super constant round protocol. So uh, already you have to worry about whether Fiat Shamir even makes sense in this setting. And uh, you can show it works in the random oracle model. I think this was already known, that it works in the random oracle model. Um, but it's not clear if correlation intractability suffices. The previous proof doesn't generalize to the setting. Uh, and then on top of that, if you can if you can, in fact, rely on correlation and tractability, you then need to make sure that whatever relation you wrote down is actually efficient, so that we can, uh, at least if you want to simplify the assumptions you're making. Um, and so just very quickly, uh, I want to mention like one nice idea that came out of the, the work, which is the notion of round-by-round round soundness, sort of unrelated to the unambiguous soundness that Guy was talking about, but a different flavor. Um, so a protocol has round-by-round round soundness if, intuitively, you want to say that there's some doomed state such that, like in the soundness analysis, you should start out in a doomed state. 
Uh, and then in every round, whenever the verifier sends you something, it is a very low probability of you escaping the doomed state. So, uh, and then at the end, uh, if the full transcript is doomed, then the actual verifier should reject the protocol. Um, so, uh, so you can you can see fairly easily that the SumCheck protocol and the GKR protocol satisfy this notion of round by round soundness. The high probability depends on the round, right? It should be much bigger than one. Sorry. You're saying with high probability it's doomed. The high probability should depend on the number of rounds. So it should. It should be yes, yes, yes. That is the slide. So, so just very quickly, like I want to show that like this soundness, even though you have a super super constant number of rounds, still suffice. Like you can still do Fiat Shamir using correlation and tractability. It's a very simple argument. Once you've like thought about the, like once you phrase the definitions the right way, the argument is very simple. Namely, think about a relation where inputs are partial transcripts, and outputs are verifier messages. And the relation is satisfied if you start out doomed, but you end up not doomed. Uh, round by round soundness exactly just said that this relation is sparse. And correlation and tractability for this relation will sort of directly translate to soundness of the fiat Shamir protocol. I don't want to like, do it in too much detail, but, this is, but you can show this works. And, and <coughs> so okay, this, 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 is, this is what Yael is saying. So you need somehow the, 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 uh, the low probability of becoming not doomed to outweigh the number of rounds uh, so that you can union bound them. Exactly what Yael said. OK. And, uh, and so as I was saying, Sumjek and GKR, you can show, uh, fall into this framework. The other thing I said you had to worry about was sampleability of the relation. So this is the relation. And you can check that in, uh, that in the case of GKR, you can sample the relation in time poly t, where t is the time to deterministically decide this language. Uh, and so uh, what's super nice for us is that because uh, GKR is considering delegation in a restricted setting where you actually have polynomial time computation in the first place, this is an efficiently sampleable relation. You can hope to apply fiat Shamir based on the framework I've written down already. OK, so that's all I want to say about super strong assumptions. But question. So how bad is the running time of the hash function? Good. So, so in order to get reasonable delegation, right, you need the runtime of the hash function to be independent, or at least have only a logarithmic dependence on this time t, right? Otherwise, you don't have any real delegation. So there's a subtlety that I skipped over, which is that you, there are two like kinds of hash functions you can have. One is a compact hash function, where the so description and the runtime is independent of the sampling time of the relation. And the other is a non-compact hash function where this is not the case. Right? Like I said I want a correlation tractability for all efficiently sampleable relations. Uh, but to get delegation, I also need the hash function uh, description and runtime to be independent of the sampling time. Um, this is why the two assumptions for the delegation and the Nizik result are not the same. Uh, you need to make this stronger assumption in order to get this compactness property. Uh, but then on the other hand, for the if you if you if you don't care about succinctness, then you could, you could even you know, specify a time bound on the sampler first and then write down a hash function afterwards. And, uh, and this is what allows us to rely on search LWE for the NISIC result. OK, so that's all I want to say on optimal hardness based results. In the remaining time, I want to talk about uh, standard assumptions. So it turns out, surprise, uh, that we can actually instantiate Fiat Shamir in very special cases under standard assumptions. So until now, or rather even now, we don't know how to apply this to, to delegation. But we do, know how to do the, we do know how to apply Fiat Shamir to classical honest verifier zero knowledge protocols and to get out NISICs afterwards. Uh, this is what we know how to do. Uh, so in the, the two protocols I want to highlight are exactly going to be some uh, variant of the Hamiltonicity protocol and the, uh, cl and the classical quadratic residuosity protocol, uh, where the second thing you, you care about is possibly, like, if you're looking for counterexamples to zero knowledge parallel repetition, which I get the feeling I think is cooler than most other people do, but I'm the one giving the talk. <laughs> uh, so in case this is somehow like not to, in case some of you have missed this, LWE-based non-interactive zero knowledge is not something that we knew how to do before this. Uh, and oh, did I skip over the assumption? I did. 
the assumption is that we need a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, which is circular secure. So uh, the same assumption that you need to get unbounded fully homomorphic encryption, uh, but satisfying a quantitatively standard level of security. So the, the same assumption that you need to get unbounded FHE. This is our assumption. Uh, and then uh, in a follow-up work, uh, Piker and Sheehan actually got rid of the circular security assumption and based the hash function on plain LWE. So we had no NISIX from LWE before this. I think it's pretty bizarre that it turned out that the way to get NISIX based on LWE was to not go through, for example, the, uh, the hidden bits model or anything like this, but to do Fiat Shamir, possibly a, a little bizarre. And, and still, this is the only way we know how to do NISIX based on LWE is by going through Fiat Shamir. So, uh, good. this is all, I said this already. Uh, even more nice things, we get a dual mode NISIC, so you can have either statistical soundness or statistical zero knowledge. Uh, this should sound a little strange because like, even a random oracle doesn't give you a statistically sound protocol. Like, necessarily because there exist bad points, like, uh, when you, like in the entirely random case. When you use a random oracle, there will exist false accepting proofs, accepting proofs on false statements. But somehow, we can actually even uh, get statistical soundness by playing around with the LWE. So how do we do it? We restrict our notion of correlation and tractability to be even, like for an even smaller class of relations than we did before. So recall earlier, the class of relations that I cared about uh, was were those where you could efficiently sample a bad output given an arbitrary input. Now, uh, I'm going to ask for even more. I'm going to say, forget relations, think about only functions. And then in addition, assume that the function, or, or, or we're dealing with functions that are efficient. So it's like efficient sampleability and like extreme sparsity thrown on top. You could think of it that way. So that, that's how we've restricted ourselves further. So under the assumption, under the circular secure FHE, we construct a hash family, which is correlation intractable for all functions of an a priori bounded size. And then we show that this still suffices uh, to get NISIX afterwards. So uh, I don't have that much time, but I want to say a little bit about how we do this too. It's, it's, it's actually a very simple proof. Um, so, so the first thing that you should notice is that because we focused on getting correlation intractability for functions, the problem looks noticeably easier, actually. So what do I want? I want a hash function h such that it's hard, to, or a family, such that it's hard for every f, it's hard to find x such that hash of x equals f of x. So here's, here's a dumb idea. If I set hash of x to be 1 plus f of x, then it's correlation intractable for f. That, uh, that you should believe. Uh, of course, the problem is that this hash function description depends on the relation. And I actually wanted the opposite thing, right? I wanted a hash function such that for all relations, you can't do this. But uh, so that's what we want. And we can, so the, the idea is basically to put f inside a homomorphic encryption so that you don't know what the f is. And then somehow you will have a hash function that is simultaneously all of these. That's the idea. Uh, so this gives you a, a property that's stronger than correlation intractability that we call somewhere statistical correlation intractability. You should think of it as directly analogous to somewhere statistically binding hash functions as compared to collision resistant hash functions. Uh, so, so what is it? There's a, there should be a way for generating keys that depends on the function f, such that no matter what function f you start with, you can't, like the keys are indistinguishable. So maybe there's some natural uh, distribution of keys, and all of the f-dependent keys are indistinguishable from the natural keys. And when you start with a key that depends on the function, you get this correlation and tractability property statistically. There will not exist any x satisfying this equation. And, uh, and we construct this object. Uh, again, you should believe that this implies correlation and tractability. It's a, st a standard like one-step hybrid argument that this suffices for correlation and tractability. So, uh, let me show you how we do it. Here's homomorphic encryption. Hopefully you've seen this before. Uh, you can encrypt uh, inputs, apply functions, and decrypt and get out f of x. Uh, as I said, we're going to assume circular security, which 
which uh, technically for us means that, give it, that encryption of a secret key looks like encryption of zero. Uh, so here's, here's the hash function. It's actually super simple. So take this homomorphic encryption scheme. The hash key is going to be a public key, along with an encryption of the secret key, and an encryption of some function g that you care about. So as I said before, we're going to think about sampling a hash key depending on some function f. The way we're going to do it is by writing down this object, where g is some function that depends on f. Uh, in order to hash an input x, you do the thing that you would expect. Homomorphically evaluates the function g on the input x. That's something you can do. So at the end, you get some encryption of g of x. And, the, and, the, and the g can additionally take as input the secret key, because we've put the secret key inside the ciphertext. Uh, so an honest key you can think of as g being the all zero function. And when you want to generate a key which is correlation intractable for f, you should pick this function, which is uh, take x, take the secret key, decrypt x using the secret key, and then flip the bit. This should look very much like the original f of x plus 1 that I wrote down, but I have thrown in this decryption on top. So, uh, so here's, here's the hash function. Uh, I claim that it satisfies the properties we want. Well, first of all, uh, definitely keys with different g's are indistinguishable, assuming that the encryption scheme is circular secure. Right? That's, g is inside a red box. You don't know what it is, as long as it's circular secure. So all that's left to show is that if you generate keys using a function f, that the resulting hash function is correlation intractable for f. What this means is that I want to say hash of x is never equal to f of x. But, but here's why. If you decrypt hash of x, necessarily you get this evaluated function by correctness of homomorphic, homomorphic evaluation. And this function I literally set up to be 1 plus decryption of f of x. So that means that it's definitely not equal to decryption of f of x. right? So hash of x and f of x decrypt to opposite plaintexts so they can't be equal. And that's it. That's the whole proof. Uh, after all, that's the, uh, the proof is actually very simple. OK, so finally, that was our hash function. I still haven't said how you get NISIC out of it. I haven't said how to compile classical zero-knowledge protocols. Uh, so in, in, in a few sentences, we compile a class of protocols that we abstract out as trapdoor sigma protocols. So, so what are these? Take a three-message protocol in the CRS model now. So there's going to be some CRS. It's going to be a CRS for the commitment scheme, uh, or at least in some of the cases it will be. Um, so it should satisfy two properties. One is, is, is standard for a sigma protocol, special soundness. That is, for every, uh, for every first message, there is at most one, one challenge that you can successfully cheat on in the soundness case. So this is standard. But then on top of that, uh, I want to say that this bad second message is efficiently computable from the first message. So this should make sense if you're thinking about the kind of correlation and tractability we just worked with. It should make sense that this is a property that would be nice for us. But naively, the, the na naive way that you would try to write down this definition does not make any sense. Namely, the bad second message can't possibly be efficiently publicly computable as a function of the first message. This, like, like, at least if you're dealing with zero knowledge protocols, intuitively, this should definitely contradict zero knowledge, like being able to compute things like this. So the way that we get around this is that we say it's not efficiently publicly computable, but given a trapdoor for the CRS, or maybe, maybe also a trapdoor like based on the uh, instance, maybe also like give away the witness too. But if you have some trapdoor that's based on the CRS and the witness, then it's possible for this function to be efficiently computable without violating anything. Uh, so, and this isn't just something in theory, this is something that, that we can actually instantiate. Just like take the standard Blum protocol for Hamiltonicity, instantiate the commitment scheme with a commitment scheme that has a trap door, so a public key encryption scheme. Then you'll get exactly, well, the first property was already true. It's a, it's a one bit challenge, so it's fine. Uh, and the efficient computability is just, so, so, so what, is the, what, is the, what is the function f? 
given a commitment to some graph, you want to decide if the graph has a cycle or not. Uh, sorry, that's not, uh, not the right way. OK, you want to, uh, is that what I want to say? Yes, or say, given a graph and a permutation, OK, let's do it this way. Given a graph and a permutation, decide if the permutation applied to the graph is the original graph or not. That's like the fun that, that, that will determine which challenge you can or cannot answer. Uh, and that's something you can compute if you know what was committed to. So if you have a trap door for the commitment scheme, this whole thing becomes an efficiently computable function. So this satisfies the definition that I wrote down. And now, in again, one line, we're going to show that Fiat Shamir works for this protoc for protocol satisfying this property using the hash function that we wrote down. So again, we have a three message protocol. We want to show that the Fiat Shamir protocol is sound. And we want to use correlation and tractability for efficient functions. Well, here's the, re here's the, here's the relation or the function. The, the function is exactly the bad challenge function that I just talked about. So the, the relation is pairs alpha beta, where alpha is the first message, and beta is the second message, and the relation is satisfied if beta is equal to the bad challenge associated to alpha. I just said that given a trapdoor, at least, this is efficiently computable. And you can use this to directly argue the soundness of the fiat Shamir protocol just using the correlation and tractability of H for efficient functions. And this, this is the whole, now you've seen the entire proof now. In the slides, you've seen the whole proof. So uh, very quickly, so I, I showed a whole bunch of works uh, on correlation tractability and Fiat Shamir earlier. Uh, there's, in fact, even more. This wasn't even one of the works, because this is more of an application than a, constr than a construction, per se. But, uh, but so you already heard earlier uh, in the workshop about how you can use Fiat Shamir for the, for the uh, sum check protocol to get P pad hardness, which is really nice, and they are able to use uh, like a very slight modification of one of our hash functions in order to like give a candidate's hard P pad dis uh, like distribution that's hard in P pad. Uh, as I said, Fiat Chamber for sum check is generally is is is, is the the tool or the the assumption that they use to get it. What is super strong delivery? It's not optimal. It is optimal. Uh, yes, I, yes. I'm just being informal here. It's 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 it's, opt it's, it's basically the same thing. They have to slightly modify it because of this inefficient prover problem. Yeah. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the uh, the standard assumptions results, the one that we based on circular secure FHE, was uh, later uh, like improved to rely only on uh, standard LWE. They were very clever. Uh, like uh, they, they, they're taking the same approach, but they, but they realized how to instantiate the even like basically this like right they they realized how to instantiate our framework uh, without relying on circular security, uh, which sounds very like I don't know I thought about it and I didn't see how to get rid of the secret key, but these guys were smarter and realized how to get rid of the secret key from this uh, from this framework. Uh, so just to conclude. In this talk, I wanted to explain to you a bit about how Fiat Shamir for proofs can be provably instantiated. Uh, and the two like, ways that we do this are either by making very strong assumptions or by laser focusing on specific protocols that are easier to work with, but still possibly useful, still things that we care about. Uh, and again, I want to highlight the way that we do this is by focusing on correlation and tractability for special classes of relations that, are, that makes it easier to instantiate the security property with a proof. Uh, I think there are a ton of open questions. Here are a few. The uh, three coloring protocol, I still don't know how to do Fiat Shamir for the three coloring protocol with any commitment scheme under standard assumptions. That would be nice. Like right now there's a difference between the Blum protocol and the GMW three coloring protocol. And this doesn't make any intuitive sense to me. We should be able to do it for both. Sure both the number yes. The yes. We, right now, we only have, like, the only standard assumptions based hash function we have works for functions. And, uh, and the three coloring protocol, like, you can't think about in terms of functions. There are too many bad challenges. <laughs> but I'm not sure that this is a fundamental problem or just a problem with how we've been thinking about it so far. Sorry? Use curve production to blow. Yes. We can do we, we, we can do a zero knowledge proof for for, uh, for three coloring based on Blum. I agree. <laughs> uh, so good. Um, here's another. I needed to I needed to use uh, 
this nice commitment scheme in order to do Fiat Shamir for the Hamiltonicity protocol. And you can ask if you can do it from a trap doorless commitment scheme, like a standard or you know, a one-way functions-based commitment scheme. I have no idea how to instantiate Fiat Shamir for that based on standard assumptions. Uh, of course, the million dollar question uh, is doing Fiat Shamir for Killian. Uh, this seems way harder. It's not even a proof. So it definitely doesn't fall into this framework. But I think that there's still a good chance that some of the ideas from this line of work can be used to say something about the case of Killian. I guess, uh, again, this, uh, this work on Fiat Shamir for Killian, I already said a little bit about it. I think that there's a lot, there's a lot to say. Um, even more generally, you can ask, you know, what properties of random oracles can we provably instantiate? I mean, this is a super broad question. So Fiat Shamir was, I think of it as least, at least as a sort of quintessential random oracle property that we have had and still have a lot of trouble instantiating based on standard assumptions. But there are definitely others. And it'll be interesting to see if there's anything we can do, maybe making optimal hardness assumptions like this, or maybe just maybe finding nice new applications of correlation and tractability or related security properties that we can argue about in a similar way in order to do more than we've already done. Uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Any questions? So you say it was uh, strange we couldn't go via the hidden bits model. Do you think it's equally strange that uh, for, la for, for QR and things like that, we can't go uh, via the Fiat Shumi route? At least not the... Uh... You're saying, how, you mean, uh, how reasonable do, you think it is, do I think it is to be able to instantiate Fiat Shumi based on non-LWE assumptions? Yeah. It's a good question. I, I've, I, of course, I've given it some thought. Who wouldn't? Uh, I don't know. Right now, the construction, we, the standard assumptions-based construction we have is is, base, is using homomorphic encryption. Even the the later Kirsten Cena results, it's not like explicitly using homomorphic encryption, but it but it still is. Uh, and we don't have this based on other assumptions. Uh, I think maybe the right direction to think about here is can we not use homomorphic encryption but some weaker form of homomorphic cryptography that you can instantiate based on uh, based on other assumptions like homomorphic secret sharing is one of the first things I'm, you might think of uh, in this line you know so I, I would say maybe the right question is can you use any of these weaker homomorphic objects to instantiate correlation and tractability as well I think it's a good question I don't know the answer yet but I think it could be you can probably use a peer scheme if you don't care about like Oh, and you can get uh, from the same assumptions. You can get uh, some something like homomorphic encryption for branching programs. Okay. It's it's not. But it's, yeah, it's not quite the same. I mean, of course, I. Yeah, but it's strong, strictly stronger than PIR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also do it from exponential assumptions. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exponent, but but there's still a gap in there. So from a hidden bit model, what you can get, you can't get there. Uh, Yeah, it's a very good question. I don't know the answer, but maybe. Yeah. So we know snarks from these like really strong assumptions, and then physics from these other assumptions. Do we know any assumptions that give both zero knowledge and succinctness under the fiat shamir transformation? Oh, I, I didn't think about it, but you can probably modify GKR to make it zero knowledge, right? And you can probably then apply something on top of that. I, I don't take my word for it, but I, I expect you can probably do it. Like, uh, so the, the result that we have that's succinct is for deterministic languages. If you put in non-deterministic languages, you still have the, the witness time. It won't be... Oh, I see. Be... I see, I see, I see. Yeah, good. So, uh, yeah, so this is why we have to be careful when we use the word snark. Like, the, the GKR protocol is for only deterministic uh, languages, right? Uh, so if you're already, yeah, if you're already thinking about NP languages, yeah, sorry, I'm not actually sure off the top of my head like how you would like actually write this down, but uh, I guess you were saying like uh, so people. So I, I, I don't think our results give uh, like snarks for NP. Of course not. No, no, no. I mean that's. I see. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so I should highlight again. We definitely do not get snarks <laughs> for all NP languages. We can only get succinct arguments for languages that are already in P, and so this is a this is quite. Yes, yeah, so the verifier is running very quickly, like way, fa way faster than the time to decide the language, and the and the message is short. But we we, we don't have this for NP languages. That would.
basically amounts to doing fiat tremere for a Killian style protocol, and we don't know how to do that. Okay, if you have more questions, uh, let's ask Alex during the break, and let's take that. <laughs>